Happy Friday, everybody. Happy Friday. Cheers, my dears. It's our time. It's cocktail time. Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Deanna. It is so good to see you this Friday. It feels extra good for some reason. It's just been such heavy winter days, hasn't it? I'm very upset with myself, though. I've been busy for the last hour. Um, you know, my new technology here where I'm loading things in so we can share the screen. I, I was doing so well, remarkably well for me. All of a sudden, I pressed a button and I couldn't see my files anymore. So the first half of the show tonight, I will be able to share great technology by sharing my screen. The second half of what I want to show you is going to have to be done old school, boring style by holding up the book, which I hate and don't think I'm sliding backward. I just, I pressed a button and I did one of my classic, did I do that? And it, I did, and there was no way to backpedal. So we will do the best we can. I'm trying not to be completely defeated by it because it's Friday night. Cheers, my dears. Happy Friday, Karen. Good to see you, Robin. Cheers in Wisconsin. Cheers, my dears. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself over there with those comments. Mom, good to see you. Happy cocktail night. I miss you. You got your glass of wine. Not sake tonight, I guess. Just the wine. Sounds great. Donna, you have your Chardonnay in a mason jar. That, that speaks of class. I'm, I'm not being sarcastic. That is fantastic. I love it. I have really big mason jars, too, like the giant, giant mason jars. We could do some damage there. Tara, cheers, my dears in Ontario. Good to see you. Mm. Kirsten, I bet it's nippy in Vermont. I bet. Cheers, my dears. Happy Friday. Elaine, good to see you, Elaine. I haven't seen you for a while. Happy cocktail time in Texas. Cindy, good evening. I'm glad you're there. Hey, Karen's working on a rum and coke. That is super civilized. There is some serious uh, cocktailing happening. Becky, good to see you. Cheers in Indiana. I hear Wisconsin is a bit chilly tonight, Robin. Oh, wow, that is very far below 17. Bray York, cheers in Kawartha Lakes, Ontario. Your first time being here. What a fun group. It is a fun group, and you are going to contribute to that fun. Super welcome to you, and happy Friday night. I'm glad you're there. Oh, happy Friday, everybody. Let me scroll down a little bit more. I'm so afraid to touch anything now after that button incident. Oh, let's see. Doing some chattings back and forth. Caroline, good to see you. You are there and you are ready to go. Happy Friday night. Christine, happy Friday in Brockport. Very cold today. Hideously cold today. It really was rough. Rochelle, great to see you. Happy Friday night. Cheers, my dears. Enjoy. Cheers, my dears. Good to see you. Happy Friday night. Let me take a quick swig. I think I'm caught up. Am I caught up? Not quite. Let's see. Aileen. Hello in Toronto. Great to see you and happy Friday night to you. We have a great show tonight. I'm excited. I'm frustrated with myself because I already took photos of all the images I wanted to use, but I just have to let it go because it's just the way it goes sometimes. Technology defeats me, um, but we have a great show. We are, as you know, looking at our giveaway book for this week. Our first week, that's Teddy calling, sorry. Our first week was um, Hooked on Words by Ellen Banker. Um, these are all books this month that are uh, put out by the Rug Hooking Magazine Press, right? All beautiful books with a special focus on inspiration, right? As opposed to being very technical books, a, a very strong focus on the inspiration side, which is the side I think we, at least together on the show, talk about and think about most often. Um, so the current book for this week is Portraits by Anne-Marie Littenberg. So this is the giveaway book for this week. And the drawing will be on Monday morning at coffee time at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, I have the link to the video um, where if you would like to enter the drawing for this book, there's three copies being given away. You go to the link that's in this video, the description of the video you're watching now, and it brings you to a YouTube video where I say, here is the book, and this is what you need to do. Put a comment about where you're from, and that will enter you in the giveaway. And on Monday morning, I will number them all, do my randomizer on my phone, do the drum roll, and pick three winners. So this week, this is the book that we have been looking at, Hooked Drug Portraits, and it has been super, super inspiring. What a wonderful week looking at a book that, for me, was so unexpected. Michelle is the master, in my mind, of portraits. 
Um, and I am not. So this subject for me has always been a bit sort of dainty uh, approaching because I'm not super knowledgeable about portraits. Um, having said that, my definition in, during the course of this week and looking at this book together, my definition of what a portrait is has changed hugely, right? It's gone from apples is apples to apples could be oranges. So in that regard, it has been wonderful looking at this book together because it's given me the idea that a portrait really is anything that is has a soul, a person, an animal, um, a, a group, right? Um, and tonight we're even going to push the boundaries of that definition by some of the rugs that we look at tonight. It's going to be a lot of fun. I see more, more loggers on. Anita, great to see you. Happy Friday night. <laughs> and I haven't seen you for a while either in Calgary. How are you? Happy Friday night. Oh, you're chatting about where you're from. That makes me so happy. Crafters Grimoire Sanctuary. Hello and happy Friday night. I'm so glad you're there. I'm waiting for your always intelligent and helpful comments. Everybody's always making really thoughtful comments that are super helpful and keep the conversation going uh, and keep me focused, which is the main thing. So one thing I want to tell you that I, I didn't forget, but if you remember the last episode, I think was yesterday. And I was um, I was snowed I was snowed in the day before, so I forgot a crucial piece of paper I had because I spoke to Rochelle on the phone. Tonight's episode we are going to include quite a few of Rochelle's um, hook drug portraits, right? Some of multiple people, some of one, just all exquisite. The top, the toppermost, poppermost. Um, and I was telling you in the last episode when I had left the piece of paper on my desk that had the crucial information, I wanted to let you know that Rochelle LeBlanc is having an online course and it's going to be March and September, right? And they tie to each other. So they go together starting March 1st, right, Rochelle? This is an online course and Rochelle really is the master of portraiture and faces. Um, and we talked for quite a while on the phone the other day. This course sounds absolutely amazing. Looking in March at part one, finding um, a designing, do, you know, figuring out perspective, proportion, um, figuring out the measurements, the math to set you up for success in planning your own piece, right? So the sort of um, starting points in March, the first part um, is like the planning and the getting going. And then in September, you're looking at the same work, the same piece, the same project, looking at dying, looking at other aspects of it. So it really is a complete A to Z course. And if you are looking to learn how to, number one, Zoom course, so it's open for everybody, no matter where you are. If you are looking to work, particularly, I think, right, Rochelle, in portraiture, there is nobody better than, than Rochelle. There is nobody, and you know that already, if you look at Rug Hooking Magazine and you just look at rugs in general, there is nobody better. Um, so this would be great information. And my impression chatting with Rochelle was that you are, Rochelle, you are so nice. You are so sincere and genuine and forthcoming. And it is so nice to encounter other people who are involved in rug hooking, particularly teachers, who are just heart on the sleeve, information is out there, no holes barred, happy, excited, willing to impart all of the information that people need to be successful in doing their own work, right? Not holding anything back, telling you everything that she knows to set you up for success. That is, we really need more teachers that work like that and are less of the old school of, I keep my bag of tricks to myself so my work is superior, nobody knows why. Rochelle is, I can tell, not one of those people, right? So this is gonna be a wonderful, um, super education. So be looking for that um, on Rochelle's um, website, right? RochelleLeBlanc.com. So I just wanted to say that because I mentioned it the other day and I didn't have the information in front of me. I'm so sorry about that. She said if you go on her shop page, there's a news page and there's uh, a video too. So you might want to go on and check out some of that stuff. Rochelle, the conversation is now three days old, so it's not as cohesive in my head. It's not flowing as well as I was hoping, but it sounds like a tremendous opportunity to take this class. And it's called Design... I can't read my own handwriting, design, Rochelle, help me out, process, uh, master class. And I asked her, does that mean that as a beginner, it wouldn't be the right class? And she said, absolutely not. Um, it is for everybody. It is 
very good for beginners. And it sounds like it is going to be good for beginners because it's going to walk you right from the beginning right to the end of the process. So body proportions in women, kids, composition, all those important things that are really crucial in terms of setting, setting yourself up for success and starting a new project, right? So it sounds great, Rochelle. I'm so excited. Um, and we will spread the word. Oh, not on Zoom, online videos. I'm so sorry. You know what that was? Me not knowing the difference. Isn't that something? I mean, I am turning 50 next month, not like 98. I mean, it's just remarkable how I don't understand things. Thank you. Not a Zoom class, an online class. So that's even better, right? Because that's very flexible. Good Lord, what is wrong with me? Honestly, what is wrong with me? Oh, some more buddies came. Okay, Ta Tara, we said hello, and I'd love to see you as you know. Joan, good to see you in Wisconsin. Lily, you popped on. Great to see you. Great to see you. I bet you're at work right now. Sneak it outside the door a little bit, are you? You deserve it. You deserve it. Dave, great to see you. Meatballs and cider. Dave. This is the year I'm coming for a tour. I'm coming to Toronto and I want like a week long tour. Honestly, I do. It's going to be so annoying having me there. I'm going to be such, such a fuss budget with wanting to see and do everything. Moss Rose, greetings from Kansas. Well, greetings back to you. Happy Friday night. Great to see you. Crystal, great to see you. All the buddies are on. <laughs> I will keep an eye on that. And I want to get started because there's so much to say tonight. Finding the Design Process Masterclass. Thank you, Rochelle. Rochelle, if you are able to put a link right there, that might be really good. I know I can't because if I touch that button, all kinds of hell, that Pandora's box is going to open. Um, but if you want to put a link there, absolutely do it because I know a lot of people will be super interested. I want to pick up the thread for a few. Oh, I hope so, Dave. I hope so. I want to pick up the thread for a few things that um, we started talking about already and tie up some, some loose ends before we move on into the commentary for tonight. <sighs> one of the things, right, one of the things, we got so, I don't want to say sidetracked, we went down some beautiful rabbit holes yesterday in the episode um, where I was snowed in, like, in the corner against Jocelyn's bunk bed trying to do a show. Um, with the animals, and by that I mean children, near me. So during that episode, we went down many rabbits, rabbit holes together. We were talking about, a little bit about Amish toothbrush, a little bit about different techniques, about attaching when you work with cotton as opposed to wool, uh, attaching pieces, right? So you can roll them into rag roll, rag ball rolls and work really well and quickly that way. And we also were talking for a moment about this crazy lead that I stumbled into. This is just going to be a short conversation as a preface. Um, I'm not going to go fully into detail now because I can see that this is Pandora's box and I'm super excited. But I did mention that I would carry on with the conversation here. So I don't want you to think I forgot. On eBay the other day, it was my lucky day. It was my luckiest day on eBay ever because if you watched the last episode, this little book popped up. Little diminutive style t sized, tiny, teeny tiny little book. And it says the oldest house. And this was a rug hooking store that was in Provincetown on Cape Cod. You know, Cape Cod is my favorite place and Provincetown is certainly one of my favorite places in the entire world. Um, and I'm fairly knowledgeable about the history, like the artist colony that are there, some of the big names that are there, but not about the oldest house, which was a Cape Cod hooked rug company. And I have to say, I can't remember if it was Karen or Sharon yesterday that asked me, who is associated with this uh, oldest house business? Because inside that little folder came this pamphlet. Um, and these are all pull-out pages that show you individual patterns, right? So I'm not going to go into this now because this really is like the never-ending story. And I, I fully intend to complete, continue and complete the story at some point. Um, but as of now, I gave wrong information yesterday because either I think Karen or Sharon asked, um, who is, who's associated with it? Who's the author of the book? Well, there is no author of the book, but I looked a little bit further and this quote stood out, right? The organization of makers of Cape Cod rugs resembles a medieval craft guild. That's very pretentious, isn't it? Well, just let that go for the moment. The designs are made and the, the designs are made and the work directed by Elizabeth Waugh. So I brought up that name, but I didn't realize she is the kingpin of the oldest house. So 
It is not clear at all from this pamphlet because it almost immediately, it goes right from an introduction to how the rugs are made in, in terms of how you hook. And then it goes right into designs. Some of the designs in this book that we will go into in a full episode are the best designs that I have ever seen in my life. I just, I just felt very unwell looking at it. Stomach cramps, overly excited, just not well in general. Um, there's a lot to be said. There's a lot to be told. There's a lot more to know. But one thing I figured out with that name, Elizabeth uh, Waugh, ringing a bell, um, was that she's also the co-author of this book that we have covered either on Cocktail Time or Coffee Time, Collecting Hooked Drugs. So this is a nice older book from, is it like the 1940s or something? If you look back, you'll find our at least one episode on this, I feel, 1927. I feel like it was a um, Cocktail Time episode because I feel it was one of our cozy episodes. So these two people are the same. That part I have figured out in with very limited time today. Um, but I did send a very probably psychotic message to the Preservation Society in Provincetown. It explained um, who I am and what I'm trying to do with putting the history of this together and explained the names. And I also noticed that one of the images in this book, if you know the artist Peter Hunt of Provincetown, it was a whole moment in school that started like right about 1940. Um, very important artist. And we have talked about him on coffee time for sure, right? Because I talk about his style of art and he had a school of art under him. So there were other artists who were painting decorative furniture um, and also like paintings, but mostly decorative work. It really had a look at a style. And this particular rug um, is haunting me, is haunting my dreams because it's not a Peter Hunt, but it sure looks like the characters in all of Peter Hunt's work. So I put that specific conversation to whoever picks up the psychotic email at the Provincetown Historical Society. Um, and I said, you know, there's a few things I wanna know here. Do, we, do you have any information there about Elizabeth Waugh? Do you have any information about the oldest house, about this rug hooking company that I have to assume was there? My guess would be 1920s to 1940s, um, which just about comes up to the time that Peter Hunt would be very active and very well known in P-Town, Provincetown. Um, and I asked them if we could work together on the chronology of this. It might be that there's nobody there for a long time, so this might be a giant to be continued. But I feel like this is so good. It, it could very well be that this rug hooking store was only open for a short time. And they seem to be, I'm recognizing the lines of many of these designs, they seem to be copying antique rugs only, with the exception of that one that looked like a Peter Hunt. I don't think it is a Peter Hunt. I think everybody was just swept away um, with the style of Peter Hunt during those decades, right, in the middle 20th century. If you lived in P-Town, you were swept away by Peter Hunt. I mean, he was, he was the guy. He was, he was the design sort of icon of that moment and continues to be strongly associated with Cape Cod. Um, but we have a lot more to find out. So I'm going to put the brakes on that until I can find out the full story and share it with you because it sounds like an amazing story. One of these forgotten little rug hooking stores that is long gone, that didn't even make it to the era of the Wall Street Journal for us to mourn and say, oh, they're not there anymore. This is one that I, I didn't even know existed as a person who graduated high school on Cape Cod and has lived on Cape Cod and knows it inside and out and a rug hooker. I didn't know. So we have got a lot more to explore there, and it is going to be fun going down that rabbit hole. And I can't wait to show you all of the designs in this book. Let me find out as much as I can, and then we will have a blast out episode on that subject. So let me catch up. Oh, Barbara, good to see you. Happy Friday. Lily, you're home from work. Good for you. Crazy with COVID, I know, because Lily is a nurse. It's going to be super busy there. Rochelle is amazing. Oh, I love reading your comments. Um, Crafters Grimoire Sanctuary, I'm knitting up my 2020 scrap yarn now. Good for you. 2021 scrap will be hooked. Sounds perfect. And 22 respectively, of course. Heather, I miss you. I have got to see you soon. Uh, Bodiful, what a great name, Suzanne. Good to see you in North Carolina. Oh, Lily says, I only have a week left of Rochelle's class with faces. Uh, which she was kind enough to let me continue, but COVID has killed me. So hopefully, yeah, I know it must be emotionally and time-wise so, so, so draining and exhausting. Um, I cannot imagine, but I commend you, of course, and I and I miss you. I'd love to catch up. Hopefully, when you come in June. Um, so let's move into our 
main content for the night. I know I have more things to tell you. Um, before I forget, just in case you're local, tomorrow, I, tomorrow I'm teaching at Madison Wool in Madison, Connecticut, near me here. And I'm doing the mandala class, which is a beginner class, going from drawing your design, transferring it, and beginning it together. It's a kit. Uh, so that's tomorrow. And then on Sunday, our Magdalena class. Our Designing Like Magdalena is a Zoom class. So I will be with you Sunday night for that. I'll send that information out tomorrow. I was working on that this morning. There are many, many, many pages because I always give you a huge kind of um, collection of drawings that you are absolutely free to use. You have There's no need to credit me. They're just drawings that I did that are for you to run with. And these are drawings that are in the style of Magdalena Briner Eby. And we are gonna be looking at her style, her work, her tricks, her tropes, but also this morning I'm realizing that I wanna introduce another element to this class, which I think is gonna be extremely helpful and make it a bit more multidimensional. It's a 100% Magdalena class, but I also wanna include information, text, and lots of images where we look together at rugs that were Magdalena era, right? So like mid 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, that era. I want to look not just at her work, but the work of other people who's, who had, not unknown, anonymous people, whose rugs were made at the same time. And look at comparisons in terms of composition and tricks that people are using. Magdalena is very different. But I want to look in context at other things that were happening at the same time because I think it's going to be helpful for us, composition-wise, to come up with twice, not even twice, multiply the amount of tricks we have in our bag after this class from thinking about composition in that time period and then layering on that Magdalena specific stamp, right? All of her animals up in the air. So the class is really evolving as a very complete, fun, and different class that I did last time I ran the Magdalena class. This is a reprise. So people who are taking it will have all the same information as the first time I ran it early, like a year ago. Um, but there's going to be another layer of interest here that I think is going to really help you and inspire you with doing rugs that look, number one, like Magdalena rugs, and number two, like antique old rugs. So that should be lots of fun. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to it, too, so much. So let's get back to this book. Let's see how far we can get um, with my stupidity because it, it goes so much nicer when we can share our photos. But where we left off last week, I'm going to do a little showing and sharing. And I'm going to be doing a little holding up because of because I was boobing it up to such an extent today. So I think we left off right around Obama yesterday. And, you know, in the course of this book, Anne-Marie Littenberg is giving you so many tips um, for success, for helping you plan. And, for example, here's a whole list of tips on the layout and proportion of faces. Now, this is something that Rochelle was talking about, too very specifically and extremely helpful, right? Because whether you're working in a photorealism style or in a very abstract pop art, Andy Warhol graphic cartoony style, regardless, you really need to understand basic things like proportion and how the face breaks down. If once you understand it, you decide to completely disregard it and break the rules, you will break them more successfully having known them in the first place, like with most things in art, right? So for example, she gives tons of tips on the layout and proportion of faces, really specific things and lots of them. Like for example, Leonardo da Vinci believed it was important to understand proportion in humans and animals in order to accurately represent them in paint. While our medium is rug hooking and not paint, some of the basic concepts about proportion in human faces and heads are helpful to keep in mind. Grab a mirror and see if da Vinci's rules of proportion apply to your face. And then she goes through a series of rules, right, a la da Vinci, so he, probably, he probably knew quite well, right, um, that are all really interesting. And I'm not giving them all because there's a lot, right? And again, you might win this book, you might own this book, or you might want to buy this book if you don't win. It is definitely worth having in your library. Things like the distance between the mouth and the bottom of the chin equals the width of the mouth. Right. Super specific. Uh, the distance between the base of the nose and the bottom of the chin is the same as the length of the nose. It is also the same as the length of the forehead. We often think, I remember this from um, art class when I was real young, 
we often think of eyes as being located at the top of the face. However, they are actually located halfway from the forehead to the bottom of the chin. So things like this that are super helpful, there's many of them. And when you read them, you can't help but think, how do we not all look exactly alike when these proportions really hold, like hold true? Well, thankfully we don't, right? Thankfully we don't. So um, interesting, lots of information, lots of examples uh, in chapter two for planning, right? In chapter three, Anne-Marie Littenberg comes to designing your rug. Um, I think this is, I think I'm already starting with images I'm going to have to show because of my failure with technology today. Um, but this first one is going to be so well worth it. The Orchard by Rochelle LeBlanc, who's on tonight. The Orchard is, uh, this is such a haunting piece. It almost reminds me of um, Rossetti's poem, um, Goblin Market. I guess because there's fruit and it has that orchard setting. So beautiful. 33 by 44, hand-cut, hand-dyed wool, and cashmere on linen. So really kind of mixed and so, so, so lovely. Rochelle says um, she based this rug on a fleeting moment that she says, took my breath away watching my girls. I can completely identify with that. And this is, let me see if I can bring it in better. I'm going to bring it up here. You know, let me turn my light a little bit. There we go. You can see why she really is like the best. But it's so, it is so haunting and beautiful. It's like heartbreakingly beautiful. Moment in time, two little sweethearts, little bare feet. Rochelle, I love how you broke the border here too. I noticed you did that on one of your other pieces with the leg. It's so inviting and welcoming to break the frame like that. It's so immediate um, and intimate. Um, I absolutely love that device. So the point of, yeah, so I think we're getting spammed again if someone wants to kill that monkey head. Um, so the point of this chapter is to talk about things like, so you want to do a portrait. Um, do you want to do a headshot, right? Uh, if you're a photographer, you say just headshot. Do you want to do a group photo, like some of the ones we looked at on the first episode? Um, do you want to have more than one person in the shot, right? So in the in the rug. So all of these considerations are important when you're planning, right? Um, there are some kinds of rugs, certainly, that you can just sit down and start drawing on your backing. I do that all the time, but probably not this kind of rug, right? When you're when you're doing something that is going to be regarded as a portrait, you really have to think through, go through the motions and think it through. And I think you'll find that you're that you're very grateful and thankful that you took the time to do that because it is going to take a little more thought and planning. It's something very specific, right? It's not like you're doing a graphic or a, log, a series of log cabin blocks and you're just hooking them for funsies while you watch the thorn birds. It's like, you know, and isn't it nice to watch the thorn birds? But, um, you know, it, it really is going to take some thought, some planning, some knowledge, and a little bit of expertise because this is a genre. This is more specific than just sitting down and getting going, right? All willy nillies. The shading is amazing. Yeah, that, R Rochelle, that really is the thing with you. I mean, the, everything is perfect and everything is right. But for me, too, the shading is just, the colors and the shading, it has that um, really soft palette. It's really almost antique -y. Um, But the shading still remains partly graphic, right? It's not the photorealism. And I know that it's not because I don't like the photorealism myself. And I love your work, so it can't be, right? So it's something in between, and it's very impressionist, right? The swirls of color um, that you're seeing in the background, for example, it's very impressionist. The way that the girls' garments are kind of shaking out, um, very fluid, and using high contrast, right? Not going, not going the Promagon swatch set. You haven't got 18 shades. Uh, coming from the waistband down, you've just got maybe three or four. It's really, really effective, and it works, right? So and it, it, this always comes back to this thing with, you know, when we talk about teachers and talk about learning, there are always going to be people who, and I learned this from my class of 22 this week, who are very, very technical, and they really want you to show them where to put the color. And it, it's going to be an ongoing job, you know, because you put it in and then you need to say, now you put this one here. And that's the way they work best and that's the way that they're happiest. Um, but for me personally, I'm always looking for teachers, who, rug hooking or anything, 
who they know something that I don't know because I haven't figured out how to do it the same way. They know something that I don't know and I don't care if that person is certified, if that person is knighted, I don't care. I just care that they know that thing and I love that thing and I want that thing in my bag of tricks. So this is why it's so nice to, when you see the work of somebody who you really love, that you know, if you have the opportunity to take a class with that person and you say, I, I want that thing, I want that. That's what I'm signing up for. The most important thing is that je ne sais quoi, that thing you can't put your finger on, um, that is unique to each artist, right? It's an artist thing more than a technical technique thing. Rochelle definitely has that thing. Now, this next portrait is so funny. I absolute. oh, what book is this? Um, well, Lily, you're in luck. This is uh, Hook Drug Portraits by Anne-Marie Littenberg. And we're giving three away on Monday, so make sure you follow the link to the YouTube video. And I'm doing a drawing for three, uh, sponsored by Rug Cooking Magazine on Monday. So make sure you get in there and do that. This portrait is so funny. It's so different. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because I didn't take a photograph of this one. I was just going to hold it up like this because, you know, it's tough when the image is right over the centerfold. It's real tough. Uh, but you can see this is a very different kind of portrait. Oh, man, Teddy really wants his mama tonight. I hope everything's all right. Um, this is a very different kind of portrait, right? So let's just look at this so we can we can speak the same language for a minute. It's going to be different, and it's going to be charming. So Julie Rogers, this piece is, is called Family Jeans. It's 40 by 26 and a half, number 8 cut, hand-dyed, um, and as is wool on monk's cloth. So I'm going to... I'm gonna, um, work into this a little bit because I think that this is a great example of a portrait that is not exactly a traditional portrait, is it? And there's so much to be said for this sort of wrinkle within the genre of portraiture um, because this, this is something that requires a lot of thought, I think, in conversation. Julie Rogers approached creating a family portrait from a unique perspective. Rather than hook images of people, uh, blue jeans represent each member of the family as they were in 1998 the year this piece was completed. The largest belongs to her husband, Bill. The next size down is her pair. The smallest represents her son, Sam, who was six. And the overalls were her daughter, da daughter Alita, at the age of three. Note how Julie's background is thematically appropriate to the composition. You would expect to see an outdoor view beyond the clothesline. Julie, however, did not concern herself with hooking the real view past the clothesline of her backyard. She edited the composition to omit many extraneous houses, because of course it would have become very busy and a bit confused at that point, right? Uh, uh, she edited, uh, including her own, leaving only the barn, right? Which creates a very pastoral, rural um, feel to it. The distant mountains and the red barn tell a story about this family, suggesting that they live in a rural community where old-fashioned traditions such as hanging clothes out on a line still exist. Julie does. She lives in Vermont. Using this landscape as a background for her family portrait, uh, she enhances the image. And we're going to look at it again. Often portraits are enhanced by the simplest of backgrounds. Here are some tips for designing the right background. And again, I'm not going to read all the tips because there are, this is all, this is all tips, right? This is like uh, more than a dozen tips. Oh, Crafters Grimoire said, there's a photo of my dad picking raspberries off uh, trellised um, canes. I am seeing that as a hooked rug portrait. Absolutely. But first, you have so much to learn. Well, you have some to learn. You have some to learn. But then you can jump right in and attack it. Because that subject and that idea is already there for you. It's the seed. So you're ready to go. It's just a question of you finish up your knitting. When the time is right, you'll feel better about starting. But it sounds like you're ready to rock. Rochelle says, I teach my students in a way where they're going to be able to produce the same kind of shading, the same kind of colors and movement in their rugs. That's really important, isn't it? Because that's when you demystify doing something as precise um, and, and special looking as the kind of shading that Rochelle does, you really want to know when you sign up for a class, well, I end up knowing that too, right? Because that's one of the real signature things about her work that stands out apart from everybody else's. So it's so nice to know that you're going to get that in your bag of tricks too, right? So that's super, super generous. Many students have never drawn, designed, or painted their own designs, and they leave completely surprised at what they can do. It's, it's so true, and it's, it's so gratifying working with people 
in general in, in an artistic setting because people do surprise themselves, right? It's like so sad, but in that class I taught this one this week, there's one woman who just, it, that didn't happen. She was so nervous. Um, and I don't know why, she seemed like maybe there was something wrong, like something else wrong. Um, but she was so nervous. Her hands were shaking while she was like, you know, holding the hook. And I'm, I mean, I'm as laid back and mellow as I can possibly be um, without being unconscious when I'm teaching. So it was really hard. I was trying to help with stuff without helicoptering. And, um, but she was one of those people who she just, she, she ended up leaving when I had my back turned and I was doing something on the whiteboard. And I felt so sad. Um, but most people will relax and absorb and succeed, right? I mean, most people will when you're um, giving out so much good information and, and they're realizing as time goes on, as the class goes on or the classes go on, that there is going to be a real opportunity to do really good work and it becomes exciting. 99% um, of the time that happens. It, it is so gratifying to see people walk away and feel like, I got this, I can't believe I did as well as I did. It's, it's exciting. Um, Rochelle, so many students have never, okay, yep, I just read that one. So getting back to these genes, some of the tips that Anne-Marie gives in this book are so good. They're all very good. For example, her idea with the background is less is more. So the idea that she would sort of crop out or edit out the neighbor houses and even her own house and just leave this sort of symbolic red barn to make it a real country scene, a little bit of a road, right? It's not a dirt road, it's not a lane, it's an actual road with a stripe down it, so that's information. Um, but she does crop out a lot, because you have to imagine there's other things in view, including telephone lines and all that modern stuff, and she has omitted all that stuff in a very thoughtful and effective way. Uh, another tip, if you add elements to the background, make sure that they do not look like they are sprouting from your subject's head. That's really important, isn't it? Because sometimes with abstract backgrounds, when you're shaping it out or blocking it out, if you don't have the blocks in the right place, and you know who is the worst for this, ironically, is Klimt. If you took the Designing Like Klimt class with me, he was constantly putting giant panels of very, very high contrast color behind the women's heads. And it would often give you the impression at first sight that you're looking at a headdress of some sort or a hat. And it wasn't. It was just a choice, a very, very um, deliberate choice to constantly block right behind the head and the face. It's normally not a good idea. Obviously, with Klimt, I'm not going to say anything uh, to the contrary, but uh, it works for Klimt. But I think Anne Marie's point, it usually doesn't work, right? So that's something you want to be really thoughtful of. Look at Klimt, though, and look at the way that he does it. Uh, just so you know what we're talking about, you can make that comparison because it's very obvious when he does it. Uh, but I'm sure that you can think of examples of rugs that you've seen where the background became so busy or so geometric that you think that like a shape is attached to the head and it's not. And that can just be very confusing and definitely take away from the piece. At the end of the day, who cares, right? If the person who made the piece likes the piece and they like it just the way it is, who cares? It's perfect. But if you're worried about um, perfection and you're planning out your piece, you want to be thinking, are the things in the background distracting or are they helping advance the story, right? A little red barn in a piece that the whole story is a laundry line, that's, that's helping further the story. Um, but a bunch of random houses that might just happen to be there because literally geographically they are there, not furthering the story. So this is all part of the conversation to have in your head when you're planning your piece out, right? Rochelle says, for a successful artwork, it's important to keep in mind that the composition of the design needs to be good, but also the composition of the color. That's true. And Rochelle mentioned that you do a lot with uh, using watercolor first to sort of color plan your piece. Um, and I thought, I thought that was interesting, too. I tend to go seat of the pants willy-nilly, go forward, blast, blast forth, and, and uh, multiply. But um, yeah, my pieces don't always come out so nice. <laughs> That's probably why. But she adds other, Anne-Marie adds other tips, like add texture and movement to your background through directional hooking. Um, for instance, if you use the same piece uh, of flatly dyed wool for the entire background, in other words, she's talking about the Hutchinson kind of marble cake background. She's talking about the kind of grass that's happening here, right? You're using the same color, maybe in different tones, maybe introducing some slightly different colors, maybe spot dyed or mottled wool, and you're using that in your background, creating a pattern with your directional hooking. That's a beautiful, safe background. 
um, make sure that there is enough contrast and value between the background and subject. Look at the piece from a distance and make sure you're getting it right. That is a thing, isn't it? Looking at it from the distance. I tend to not do that enough. I feel like I would be better if I did do that always and often. Uh, Crafters Grimoire says, there is a Klimt uh, tarot deck. Oh, I bet that's beautiful. I bet that's like the best of. Uh, use muted colors in the background. Not always, not always. So that, I would never say anything, I would never say yes to anything that was like an, uh, in general, um, always, right? I'm going to show you some examples in a minute of color blocked backgrounds that are very, very loud, um, not muted at all. So sometimes, and again, think of someone like Andy Warhol, sometimes using very bright graphic color and design in the background is so in keeping with your subject and the story of your piece, your main subject, a portrait in this case, that it is helping further the story, right? Just like a, for a writer. Um, sometimes it's confusing. It's just a question of placement, lines, and emphasis. But I wouldn't say, for in general, I would not say at all that muted colors are better than brighter colors for a background. I would say it depends on your taste, it depends on the style, and it depends on the tone of the piece. And I wish I could say, because you might be a technical person, I wish I could say yes or no to that, but it's just a moving target. It really depends on the piece. So that's the fun of it, too. That's the fun of it, right? Um, looking at something in a mirror is also a good way to see composition, absolutely. Um, absolutely, because it's, it's reversed, isn't it? So your brain is already out of its comfort zone. Um, you're not used to seeing it the way that it is. And it's like that picture that we looked at, it was actually by Anne-Marie Littenberg, um, this one at the beginning, and she's in the mirror. Remember, we did this a few days ago, and she said it's funny how uh, she feels like she looks the age that she is here, but she looks much younger in the mirror. When you start playing with mirrors and using them, as you, as you really must if you're doing a self-portrait, all kinds of magical things can happen. I wouldn't say any of them are right or wrong, but um, they, it will kick up all kinds of interesting thought, right side of your brain, left side of the brain. Um, even holding up books for me on camera when they're reversed is completely impossible and confusing. So it's a good exercise to do for sure. Particularly, I think, if you're going to work on a piece that isn't necessarily realistic, if you're happy with doing something that's a bit abstract or graphic or br broken down a bit, then using that mirror could be super fun because it could already give you abstraction, right? Interesting, interesting conversation. But, you know, I'm going to share my screen for a minute too because I had some photos. Oh, I did have one other thing to show you. You know, I have this is this is a detour, right? This is a stupid detour, but I, I got to be me. Uh, does this photo remind you of, does this rug remind you of anything? For, I'm going to give you some hints from childhood, right? I, when I first saw the rug with the jeans, I, um, I had that feeling in my heart of, of panic and fear. And then I realized why. Let me see if I can share my screen with you. I, I love the portrait, obviously. Um, but does anybody remember this book? Can you see that? <laughs> Does anybody remember this book? What uh, what was I scared of? This is a glow in the dark encounter by Dr. Seuss. I wonder if you remember this. This is this book, right? I had I had to do an errand. I had to pick a peck of snide in a dark and gloomy snide field that was almost nine miles wide. Do you remember this? Is are we the only family that read this crazy book? And in the end, of course, it was about a it was about an empty pair of pants, if you remember. It was about an empty pair of green pants that were always running around the countryside empty, sometimes riding a bike, some, and, and this character thinks that the empty pair of pants are chasing him. And when I, and it was terrifying as a child, when I saw all of those pants on the line, that is the first thing that I thought of. But of course, at the end, um, I put my arm around their waist and sat right down beside them. I calmed them down, poor empty pants with nobody inside them. So at the end, obviously there's a happy ending. We don't need to be traumatized, but I thought it was hilarious. If you can see um, this image, I happened to pull this up. This is a crazy side note. I happened to pull this up on a kinder care site for children. Name that trauma. <laughs> and and this is actually, and this is actually um, 
a, a blog thing, name that trauma. Somebody was asking, hey there, Kinder Trauma. I was wondering if you could help me figure out a book that scared me for years. And she goes on to describe the pale green pants. And it was, I just found it so funny. I just found it so funny. And I have to say, for me, that book did some terrible damage because I still, when I see empty pants, all I think of the empty pants with the, the pale green pants with nobody inside them. So stupidness, stupidness, alas, it's just the, it's just the way that one's mind works, isn't it? So, um, you know, and along those lines, not the pale green pants and the Dr. Seuss, which I love, but along those lines, it, looking at the jeans as a portrait that did not have a person in the, in the, in the picture reminded me of another famous piece of artwork that I sometimes talk about by one of my famous artists, illustrators. Um, let me share that here because you're going to recognize this, I am sure. Let me get rid of that, Kinder Trauma, and come to this one. Come on. Oh, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Technology's got me. It's got me. Um, hold on. I got this. I got this. Do I got this? Get rid of that. Get rid of that. And here we go. Yeah, let me bring this down a bit. Have you seen this before? This is a Norman Rockwell. And the reason this, this came to mind for me is number one, because I'm nuts. And number two, because this is one of his most famous paintings, um, post cover, right? Saturday evening post cover. But this is one of his most famous painting, paintings. And he, this is a still life, but he considered this a portrait of his wife, Mary, right? The love of his life. Because he said of this picture that Okay, officially it's not a portrait, but it is as much a portrait of Mary and it says everything about Mary as much as any of his portraits of her face ever did. He said when he painted this, he felt that it, it spoke more to who she was than looking at a picture of her face. Because in this moment, she had just left um, the shed and she'd left her gloves and her shoes and she'd left her flowers and her hat and she was about to return a moment later and that was when he um, did the sketch and took the photo for this picture. So it just goes to show when you're talking about doing a portrait, it might not be a traditional portrait. It might be something along the lines of the pants or Rockwell, right? Interesting, but it's just another possibility, isn't it? It's just another possibility. Thanks, Mom. Crafters Grimoire said, they actually remind me of that horrible neighbor who hated hated me bouncing a ball in the driveway. She washed all her hubby's jeans at once, I guess, and hung them out on the line. They, everything has associations, doesn't it? So often terrible. Those are the things that we remember the most, I think. And Barbara says, I love this image by Norman Rockwell. I do too. I think it's so smart, and I'm so glad that he took the time. He was so, he was so forthcoming about his work. I'm so glad that he took the time to describe what his process was and why he was so in love with that picture because he was so in love with his wife, Mary. And he just felt that that really represented who she really was more than her face. So it just goes to show the portrait can be so many things, can't it? So many things. Um, now this one is really interesting. I had this one up, but I can see the photo's not gonna work. Nancy, good to see you. Love this, getting ready to do a pick with a wood fence. Absolutely, isn't that gonna be gorgeous? That's gonna be such a great composition element using fences, right? They create borders, barriers, openings when they have a gate, um, definition, right? They set perimeters. That is going to be a great piece. I can't wait to hear more about that. That's true, Rochelle says. It's because he didn't just paint things. He painted emotion. That is so true. And I think of Rockwell, you know, he knew he was painting his neighbors. And some of his neighbors, if you're lucky enough to get to the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, Mass., it's in the Berkshires, most of the people who are tour guides there were children and sitters for him, neighbors, right? And it's almost like I get so emotional when I go because when they start talking, because they're, they're quite old now, right? Um, when they start talking about their experiences sitting for him as quite young children, and then they bring you over to a painting where they're like five, uh, and it's them, and now they're there with white hair. It's, it, it's beautiful and heartbreaking, interesting, um, such a good connection. His work was so... Um, emotional, right? Exactly the right word. So emotional. Um, Crafters Grimoire, yes, Rockwell painted his neighbors in Stockbridge. He was deeply loved. He was deeply loved. Also in Vermont, when he lived in Vermont, until his studio burnt down. 
Um, I think he was loved in general. He seemed like such a kind, kind man, right? Oh, dear. Um, I can go down that rabbit hole, but I did a full episode of him two um, Thanksgivings ago. I did hooked rugs in Rockwell paintings because there's there's under 10, but there's enough to represent um, rug hooking in his paintings. And we looked at those paintings on that episode. It was a lot of fun because we talked about him, too. I thought it was the perfect thing to do for Thanksgiving, right? Um, Suze. Oh, I'm so glad you logged on. Happy Friday night. It's so good to see you. It is so good to see you. So, you know, I'm up to this picture, which is so um, absolutely beautiful. This is by um, Donna Har Harkman. I always struggle because it's H-R-K-M-A-N. Beautiful piece called Paul Lawrence Dunbar, right? That's okay, Suze. I knew you meant me. Paul Lawrence Dunbar. So this is kind of a sepia and white piece, almost like a black and white picture, but more of a sepia. Absolutely beautiful. A lot of text, right? Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Because I had loved so deeply, because I had loved so long, God in his great compassion gave me the gift of song. And you know what I love about this piece? This, this sent me on a bit of a tear this evening, too, because... I, I, I know who this is, right? He's a famous, not musician, right, uh, poet. So I thought it was exciting that she used a quote that, that um, regarded his work as song because he's very well known for being a lyrical poet, which means not necessarily rhyming or not rhyming. It just means that the way he wrote flowed in a lyrical way, the way that a song would, or even an art song, right? So he, he was very sort of well-known in his time as a poet. And you know what it reminded me of? Another bit of a detour, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Because of the times we're living in now, it reminded me of his, his best-known poem. And I wonder if you know this one. I want to share it because it's short and because it's very timely um, for where we are now in the world. So again, I want to show you the hooked rug, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, right? Absolutely beautiful. And again, he was a poet. He was a very lyrical poet. And his most famous work is a poem that's called, incredibly, We Wear the Mask. And this is the poem. It's a short poem in, in its entirety. It goes like this. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheek and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile. With torn and bleeding hearts we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but O oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but O oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet, the long, long mile, and let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. And that's the end. Uh, and it's interesting to note, so um, this is, we're speaking in metaphors. His father was a slave, right? We're speaking in metaphors. But beautiful poem that I think has a lot of parallels to now. Incidentally, I wear a mask constantly when I walk out the door. So this is not an anti-mask sentiment by any means. I am vaxxed, boosted, crazy about wearing a mask. But the metaphor in this poem about wearing a mask and hiding the way that we feel in our emotions um, I think is powerful. And I just thought, what a great parallel to the way we live now, constantly wearing a mask, symbolically, literally, metaphorically, right? Just a beautiful poem, a beautiful poet, and a beautiful rug by Donna Harkman. The hooked portrait piece is so good. It is a powerful poem. It is. The story of his life is very um, hard, right? This is, he's like a 19th century, early 20th century poet. Um, very hard. Speaking of which, this next subject, another uh, rough one, same artist, Donna Har uh, Harkman, Veterans Day, uh, 28 and a half by 35. She's in Dayton, Ohio. Veterans Day, absolutely beautiful. A couple of days ago, still looking at this book, we talked about, I think it was yesterday, expressions in portraiture, right? It's a big deal. Like it, this, this is powerful to look at. Um, super emotional, super sad. Again, look at the background, right? He's kind of, he's, he's obviously a veteran. He's wearing his uniform. 
The sky behind is uh, very active. There's a lot of movement. It's very turbulent and unsettled. Uh, but the grass behind is very peaceful and the autumn skyline behind also peaceful. Um, getting toward the end of autumn, kind of maybe a parallel for life too at that point because he's an older person, possibly. Uh, just beautiful. Incidentally, I made the horrible mistake of, I was watching the Hallmark Channel, of course, um, watching that Betty White movie. I don't know if you've seen it. It was, um, what was it called? The Lost Valentine. It had all kinds of like war. It was about um, her love in the past with a soldier who didn't come home, her husband. And whew, what a mistake it was. Well, I had it on in the background. It was like heavy, 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 heartbreaking, cry me a river, crazy, out of control emotion. But wonderful, wonderful. Um, oh, Gaynor Burley, I have this book and it's amazing. Oh, I'm so glad. Well, you know, that's what's so fun about looking at stuff together is when we look at together, we get all kinds of ideas together. Um, but you know, this is the answer to the question we just had, Crafters Grimoire. Do you have to use muted tones in the background? No, no, you don't. Look at this, Art Deco Woman, right? So. Actually, the tip that's in this book is quite apropos for this piece because remember the tip from Anne-Marie Littenberg said, uh, make sure that there's nothing sticking out of the head that is going to be distracting in terms of shape. Well, what has, what has been done here is the background immediately behind the head and the neck, right, has been kind of blocked out with one color. And that makes it possible to break out or jigsaw, shape out the rest of it with these little sort of mosaic puzzle pieces of bright color. Uh, the head is stable because there is a very rich red um, solid behind, right? It stabilizes the main story, which is the head. And then you are able to pick out with more bright colors lots of crazy small pieces, right? So that works great. That piece is by uh, Diane Phillips of uh, uh, Fairport, New York. And along those lines, another beautiful portrait. And one of the interesting things about this, this is muted tones in the background. So you can see these are both done in real bright colors. But I wouldn't say at all that the bright colors take anything away from th the piece. This has almost an El Greco look, doesn't it? Like a, like a uh, disappointed Madonna kind of a look in the face. Very, very strong. Um, this one, a similar expression or sentiment, right? Thoughtful, woeful, not, not smiling for a photo by any means. Uh, very, very good character piece. And I particularly love the substituted colors, right? All those highlights of colors that have been substituted, uh, not color for color, but uh, tone for tone, right? Like we've been talking about. And look at the mohair for the hair. What a great shaggy look that gives, right? That really is so smart. I'm gonna have to watch the time. So that piece is called Nina, and that is done by Barbara Held of Tinmouth, Vermont, 2004. Another really beautiful piece. Oh, you love it, I'm glad. So he says the facial detail in the portrait is blowing your mind. Absolutely, I mean, these are just, everything in this book is fantastic. I'm showing you, I'm scratching the surface, right? This is, this book is, is dense and full uh, of beautiful, beautiful examples. This piece is by Gloria Reynolds Stokes of Heinsburg, Vermont, Before My Hair Turned Silver. This is another beautiful piece, another great example of blocking, color blocking in the back. It has, right, definitely mid-century, 1960s overtones. This reminds me of my favorite book, Peyton Place, right? This kind of era, this elegance, uh, the kind of hairstyle, the kind of attire. The blocked out background, almost like a playing card or uh, ev evocative of like chess men, right? Very, very shapey. Very, very well done. Smart. Nice contrast in black around the border because this is colorful. It's sexy. It's colorful. It's soft. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. So there's so many things that you can do with color, uh, taking it quite far, right? And still being well within um, your means in terms of success, right? Color is not going to make you or break you. It's going to be placement, right? It's going to just be composition in the end. Um, this piece I really, really love. Looking for Red Shoes by Suzanne uh, Dermier shows how the portrait subject, and, and in this case it's her mom, and additional elements, and in this case it's many boxes of red shoes I'm about to show you, 
can be balanced so that both play vital roles in the composition. This is interesting, right? So the array of, individua of individually unique and glamorous red shoes and the lady of a certain age, framed by the orange sete, are of equal importance in this composition. On their own, they might have some interest, but together in a single hook drug, they tell a powerful tale. So let's look at this. Uh, Susan uh, Dermier, uh, Waterbury Center, Vermont, looking for red shoes, 2005. This is one of my favorites. I mean, I just, I love these kinds of stories, looking for red shoes. And I think the point that Anne-Marie Littenberg is making um, as author here is so, so important. Um, because as somebody who's done a lot of writing, too, having a story with a split focus is is its own its own pig, right? You can it, it's not that it's going to become distracted. You got to stay focused. You got to unify the two subjects, and they each make each other twice as powerful. So the multiples I always say on the show, multiples are good design. The multiples on the floor, right? And the story of her sitting on this contrasting orange against blue couch or sate, uh, sitting and thinking about the shoes. It is very very um, thoughtful isn't it? I mean, you wonder. You wonder what the story is. You wonder the before, the after, the story of each pair of shoes. You wonder where she's going. You wonder what happened before this and what's going to happen after this. This is a great, great, great story rug. And I would say in this composition that the character is just as important as all of the shoes. Absolutely at least equal. And you know this, oh, we'll see you soon, Lily. You know, at least, um, I, I have to say, and I know I've brought this up before, but I want to bring it up again because it might give you an idea. Um, years ago, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, absolutely, abs that's even better, absolutely. Yeah, that clothing and the uh, cleavage and everything, beautiful. Yeah, very, hot, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Um, years ago, I had a friend, he passed away since then, he had a rare bone disease where um, he, he didn't grow and then, you know, he, he drove and everything, but um, he had like accelerated bone uh, density loss and it was not, it was not good for many, many decades. He was a good friend and we were, we spent a lot of time together. He was a poet um, and I always thought he was very, very brave because he looked very different. He looked very different. Um, but he was a poet and he was wonderful and he did a lot of stand up and improvisational work as a poet and he joined every group that was around him. We lived then around um, Carmel, Rye, New York, that area in there. I was in Carmel, he was in Rye, but we kind of always met in the middle. And he joined this one poetry group where one night um, he told me he was having a show, so of course I went. And his piece was wonderful. He did a tortured piece and it was heartbreaking and it was wonderful. But another girl that night did, did um, a piece that I have never forgotten either. And what she did was when it was her turn, she went up onto the stage and she had like a wardrobe and she opened it up and there were a bunch of garments inside. And she took out the garments one by one, just empty garments on a hanger, hung them over the edge of the door. They were all very different. Like one of them was like a 1960s, like real bohemian psychedelic jumpsuit. The next one was like a Victorian um, like um, corseted kind of thousand and ten buttons, lacy job. They were all very, very different. And for each one that she hung up on the door, she, she recited a poem, right? She had written a poem for each one, and each one was named after a person who she had made up. So she had gone to a thrift store and bought all of these beautiful uh, articles of clothing from many, many different eras. And she made up a story for the person that she imagined wearing each of these things. And when she stood up, she went from one to the next. There was probably 10 or 15 short poems. And each one, looking at the garment and hearing what she was saying, and even knowing it was a made-up person, was absolutely magical. And that would be a great idea for a portrait, right? Think about the, the blue jeans with nobody inside them. And think about um, the shoes laying out on the floor. If you're afraid to approach portraits, maybe think of something in terms of that, right? Um, in terms of just something like the Norman Rockwell that relates to the person but doesn't actually include the portrait. If you're tiptoeing into the water this way, I just thought it was a great idea and it's certainly an idea that you can use, right? You can go a million miles with that. 
uh, very, very powerful. So, all right, let's look at a few. Let's look at a few more. It's only eight o'clock. Now, Rochelle, these are like, these are my two faves of yours, I have to say, because they have a real historical um, um, viewpoint and subject. And to me, that's amazing. I, I started reading up, hold on while we do quick cheers, my dears. Lily, it's also on the Facebook page. Our Facebook page is Row Cooking and Punch Needle Club. It's right pinned to the top, too. Um, when we started doing these Coffee Time episodes, and I realized I had so many buddies in Canada who were logging on, and we talked so much about uh, Lillian Burke and Chetty Camp and all the different things that happened in Canada that are so important to the Row Cooking timeline. I remember in one episode, um, I've only been to Canada a few times in my life and always to cities, right, when I was younger. It hasn't been lately, but it will be soon. Um, and I don't know a lot about the history. And in one episode, I said Arcadia because I was thinking about that Tom Stoppard play. And, and Betty said, corrected me and said Acadia. And I thought, oh, interesting. That rings a history bell somewhere. And then I started reading up on the Acadians and what happened to them with their land and how they were forced off of it. Um, it's such a, such a huge piece of history that I really didn't know about. So Rochelle in these... Um, pictures and these rugs is really portraying that time and I think these are stunning. This one here is called the deportation and I'm going to read you the text on that. Now again look at her sky right because this is part of what's going to be in that class. It's coming up March and September. Absolutely. I mean I don't want to say it's beautiful. It's super sorrowful isn't it? It's, it's lyrical and poetic. Fits right in with the theme of our night. It is so heartbreaking, right? You can tell uh, the mood, right? Emotion and mood. You can tell the mood is very, very somber at best. The deportation, uh, hand cut um, and dyed wool and cashmere on linen. Um, this rug commemorates the period between 1755 and 1762 when British authorities in Quebec stripped Acadians of their rights and placed them in the holds of overcrowded ships bound for destinations unknown. Rochelle's ancestors were among those Acadians. This is like a terrible part of history, um, but important to know and important to read up on because it's, yeah, it's for at least for an American person who's very keen on history, this is, this is a story that I, I don't know well enough still. The second piece, Taking Possession. Francois and Charlotte LeBlanc Acadians found their way back home to Quebec following the great deportation. Isn't that good? Like the story of coming home, but man, what a struggle that must have been. Legend has it that on June 24, 1785, they carved a cross into the bark of a large pine tree to mark their possession of the land that would later be called um, uh, Bouctouche. Uh, Bouctouche, does that sound right? Absolutely beautiful. I mean, this, this almost has like biblical looking um, overtones to me. I love this border. I love the chaos of the border. It has like pain and violence and motion. Um, also the fish, right? It's like, it, this represents all kinds of emotions and, and the whole story coming full circle. Um, absolutely beautiful. Rochelle, is the pelican and the anchor symbols of that part of Canada or of that, um, what was it, Bush, Bush, I missed it, uh, Bouctouche? That is so beautiful, so beautiful. You know, when I saw, I'm so um, shamefully, like, Americentric, right, that I just figured, oh, there's some pilgrims. But, of course, they're not, not everybody who wears 1700s clothing is a pilgrim, right? This is the story of Canada. Um, I was so happy to see these because they're so, so, so um, evocative and powerful. Really beautiful. It was not Quebec. It was, uh, it is, it was not Quebec. It is as the British governor of Massachusetts who sent the ships to deport the Acadians. Okay. All right. We've got to do some history stuff there. I'm going to have to read up on that. The governor of Massachusetts. Was that Governor Bradford at the time? Is that Governor Bradford? That's got to be Governor Bradford, right? Yeah. Hello. Oh, Kathy. Hello from Peace River, Alberta. Sorry you're late to the party. Hey, it's still a party. It's an extra party with you here. I'm going to do cheers, my dears. Oh, of course, Longfellow's poem, Evangeline, tells that story. I forgot about that. I know we've talked about that before because we brought up that poem. I went to the Wayside Inn recently, right, where, I mean, where he wrote his tales from the Wayside Inn. 
Um, but that I still haven't read Evangeline. That was one of my dad's, right, Mom? That was one of dad's favorite poems. And he had the whole series of American poets. And Evangeline was a standalone volume because it's like a long narrative poem. It's not like a, a short collection. Oh, good to see you. Mm. I'm, I'm looking at the conversation in the sidebar, too. Now, this one is really different, and I love it. Diane Phillips. Now, we've seen quite a few of hers, but this is a real departure. This is Untitled, Fairport, New York, 2007. This is so different, right? And I absolutely love it. Talk about expression, right? Maine was part of a Massachusetts colony. It was Governor Belcher. Governor Belch, interesting. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to do some reading up. It's going to be a little while, but I love that. I love that era. I, my favorite period in history is like the colonization and the settlement years leading up to the revolution. No, the dune is full of wild roses and sand piles. Oh, it sounds beautiful. Crafters Grimoire, you are good. You are good. Do I know where you're based? Have I asked you that before? Are you anywhere near me geographically? You, you seem like somebody I would love to sit down with and, and, and talk about history. There's not a lot of people you can do that with, right? It's not for everybody, is it? But I love talking about stories and, and naming names. Untitled is just, you know, it's a different kind of a portrait. You can see what they've done here is really extraordinary. We've got the split blue with the blue, the orange with the orange. It's split right down the middle in a very pop art manner, right? No mistaking. But what does this have? It doesn't have shading, right? It doesn't have perspective. It doesn't have realism. This has character, style, a massive graphic punch, doesn't it? It's colorful. It's pop art. It's really, really a strong piece. So again, it just goes to show, oh, Queens is a misprint in the book. Oh, well, good thing, good thing that you said that here because now at least people who are paying attention have that clarity, right? When you get your book, make that little change. We had to memorize parts of that poem in French school. Oh, how cool is that? That is so cool. You know, for all of the years, they had us take French because I went to a Catholic school from kindergarten to eighth grade. And then I took it again in high school because I was already quite good. So why not, right? It was like a breeze. But um, they never had us memorize things in French. I think that's really, really bad. We had, we had such stupid times in that class. We watched the Peanuts go to Paris like almost, you know, every week, which was great, but still. And... Oh, you're connecting with each other. That's great. I'm a native Massachusetts, but living in Corpus Christi, Texas. I think I, I think I remember that. Ah, bummer. One of these days, right? Rochelle is in Texas. Um, so that's a very different kind of a portrait, the untitled one we just saw. This one I have to show, The Town Hooker by Wanda Kerr. Uh, one of the great sort of rug-hooking royalty characters up in Canada, Wanda Care. She's got a great company. She does a lot with dyeing. Um, really, really important person. Um, and this portrait is much more realistic, right, than the one above it, the untitled. Sorry about my stupidness with the photos today. Let's see if I can bring you back in focus. I mean, isn't that exquisite? I would say I have hope someday of doing this, but I don't. This is, I just, this is just beyond. I know I shouldn't say that. That goes against what I teach in terms of attitude. But this is just, I feel this is so inspired, right? This is so inspired. She's absolutely beautiful. The, all of the shadows, everything about it is absolutely beautiful. What I like about it is it's realistic, but it's not like photorealism. There's still different color. Oh, I believe it. I believe it. Now, this one's really funny, too. This one's really cute. Mr. Bean and Me, Di designed and hooked by Diane Lairmouth. No, yeah, Lairmouth, Anna Cortes, uh, Washington, 2007. This is so cute. Now, this is another one with more than one character. Right. So the portrait with the pup. And how great is that? And another fantastic example of color substitution, going for some wild highlights that really, really work. I love the way that the glasses are framing the eyes, and I love that one highlight going down the face, like almost like an S shape. Really, really, really smart. Really smart. So cool, isn't it? And then remember directional hooking. That was one of the tips. When, you're, when you have a portrait and you're trying to keep it tame in the background, not muted, but tame, um, do directional hooking. That's just straight top to bottom. Vertical directional hooking. Gosh. 
Mom, if you are on, can you just call my my house phone and make sure everything's okay? Because Teddy, my son, has called about ten times, and I'm hoping that they're that the house isn't on fire. I'm thinking he's playing a video game, and he wants to tell me that he leveled up. Um, ninety nine point ninety nine percent chance of that, but nonetheless, if you have a chance. So chapter five, I'm going to wrap up uh, fairly soon, but chapter five is about adults and children and another beautiful piece by Rochelle, London Bridge. I mean, this is just amazing from your series called Fleeting Moments. This is so beautiful, so beautiful. I feel we're very lucky to have Rochelle on tonight that, you know, we can be commenting and asking questions and getting clarity on everything from technique to, to the history and storytelling. I mean, this is so beautiful, London Bridge. I completely forgot about this. I love the trees in the background, such a sort of Art Nouveau feel to them. Absolutely beautiful. I love the way the arms reach up to meet the horizon line. That's really smart, really, really smart. And I love how the two older girls are in white, right? That creates, uh, it makes it easy for the eye to see the story, the London Bridge part. And then the two little buttons going underneath. So, so, so cute. It looks very sandy now that you say that. It looks real sandy. So pretty. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, figure out what, what he's got going on. He makes me nervous. So, you know, each chapter, thanks, Jay, each chapter in this book, um, has different tips, tips and tricks for hooking children, right? This whole page, tips and tricks for hooking just children. Um, so all these interesting things to say, to learn, to know, beautiful exam beautiful examples. Um, I like this one. This one's a funny one. Uh, mirror, mirror on the wall. I am my mother after all. <laughs> this is by Susan uh, Derm Dermier, again, Waterbury Center, Vermont. This is so funny, I think. You know, very, very graphic, very, very different than a lot of the other ones in the book. I love the subject. I love the text. I love the way that they look the same. It's just, it's hilarious. It's funny. And the inset, right, in terms of composition, inset, you inset like almost like a, like a portrait, right, almost like a, inside a frame, and this is the mat. And then once you stabilize your composition with your inset, it's very clear that this is the story, you can go berserk on the border, right? And you can even add this text, right? Because it's it's going to hold together. You can go berserk because you have really stabilized it. Uh, an oval within a square, you know where to look. Your eye is supposed to look at the center, right? And once your eye does, you can blast with color everywhere else. Just crazy color. I absolutely love that. This is the one, Rochelle, that I used for the thumbnail tonight, Cupcakes on a Sunday Afternoon. The subject and composition of this rug were inspired by a black and white photograph of Roxanne as a child from the collection of Roxanne uh, Lulo. This is just adorable. Little Betty Crocker there. Let me bring it in focus. Isn't that beautiful? I love um, the textile on the wall too, whether it's a hook drug or embroidery, it's absolutely beautiful. The subject is so quaint and charming. And again, a moment in time has real sort of historic appeal to me, photographic appeal, just so beautiful. And the colors are super charming as well. Everything's fine. All right, good. All right, good. He just forgot I was on and just started calling me like a maniac. That's all right. This is a great piece too, The Almost Virgin Queen. Number uh, six, hand dyed, designed and hooked by Pat Muricalio, Capitola, California, 2012. For this self-portrait, Pat says, I like to use my leftover cut wool and hooking, and I like to focus on values of many colors for my shading, skin, hair, and everywhere, because it looks more interesting. I really love this piece. So this is the almost virgin queen, um, um, based on a portrait, of course, of Queen, queen Elizabeth, right, Elizabeth I of England, of course. Uh, beautiful. A lot of, a lot, so well done, but a lot of humor in this piece. Beautiful Elizabethan ruff, really ostentatious costume, just as Elizabeth would have worn. And look at the frame. Look at the hooked frame on this. That really is something. One of the funny things about this that I, re that I really like is that it, it looks very Elizabethan, right? Very authentically Elizabethan in terms of the character and the costume, except for the handbag and that blue background, right? It doesn't the royal family 
currently in the 20th century and now always use that royal blue background always right but not in elizabeth's time right she would go for like a brown background or be out in a garden with like fawn frolicking behind her um so that's funny it's kind of a it's kind of a um mix of styles very regal and very royal but um very different nice funny cool looking piece um uh, and then really contrasting with that this piece called still winning is a bit of a heartbreaking piece designed and hooked by sharon townsend of altoona uh iowa and Marathon, Florida. And she says, Sharon says, my mother was hospitalized and because of her age, which was 91, there was discussion about whether to let her die comfortably. Uh, I was for operating. Two days later, she was sitting up and playing cards. She lived three more years. The border design was inspired by pictures of a wallpaper design made in 1913, the year she was born. That's really poignant. No one really likes this rug, but I love her spirit, and I wanted to try to express it in my art. That is so, that's going to choke me up. That is so good. So thank God they made the decision they made because she lived another three years, right? And here she is playing cards. So you can see it's not a great moment in her life, certainly, but they've got her all hooked up, and they've got her stable, and it's not a good moment, but there's her spirit comes through. She's playing her cards. And I love using just on two sides, not all the way around, just on the two sides, using a wallpaper design from the year she was born. That is very, very thought out and beautiful. That's beautiful. That's so important to know those details, isn't it? Because it makes it so much more special. So, all right, let's look at a couple more and then we will break free. I love this one too. This one's uh, really neat. I dream in Paisley. Um, it, this is cut wool, antique chalet, and yarn on linen, designed and hooked by Ray Harrell of Hinesburg, Vermont. We did her book, Too Barely Hooked. Remember, we did that uh, a couple of times on um, Coffee Time. This is a really beautiful piece. Again, it's in the center fold. But, yeah, I love Ray Harrell's work. It's super sexual, sensual, uh, pretty, charming, shapey. It's... <sighs> It's very womanly, isn't it? The cards suggest the gambling of life. I love that. I love that. That is a nice layering. That is a nice layering. This is just a beautiful piece, isn't it? It has a real Picasso Matisse type quality, particularly the shading. Uh, I dream in Paisley, and then it shows you the Paisley hooked. It is so much fun to hook with Paisley. And it is expensive. Yeah, it's crazy how expensive it is. But I mean, you know, these Paisley shawls were a commodity, you know, in the early 19th century. And I have to say, I have been, I just finished a project hooking with, for the book, I, I finished a hooking with Paisley pro project. And what I was doing was I was hooking with a latch hook into latch backing, but I was rug hooking with the latch hook into latch backing. And I was using a lot of Paisley. And because I had such a wide gauge, wide open window pane, big wide holes of my backing. When I pulled up the Paisley, you saw so much of the Paisley. So whereas sometimes Paisley can really play you because it frays as it goes, hooking it for me into latch hook backing gave me big fat pieces coming up and you could really see the Paisley. I used five or six different Paisleys for the piece that I did and it came out great. I really recommend when you're working with fussy fabrics that are prone to um, fray, like woolens, uh, and wools, patterned wools that will not full, things like paisley, things that have lots of strands like silk dupioni and all the raw silks. If you try rug hooking them into latch hook backing, you'll find you have a lot less play. They will be able to play you a lot less. So it's a, it's a fun thing to think about. It's a fun uh, way to experiment. Stars and stripes hidden behind that nude. Yeah, there were, weren't there? Stars and stripes hitting behind. Yeah, that's true. That's true. There's a lot. Yeah, you see some good embedded stuff. Really nice. I just love that. It's so graphic, isn't it? Could be a Duran Duran cover. Absolutely beautiful. I'm looking at your conversation there, too. Um, and then she goes on to talk more about, this is such a balance between inspiration and technical aspects in this book. Measuring your face with your hand, right? Like, you know, giving all kinds of tips that are quite important. And simple things that you just need somebody to tell you. And then you're off running, you know. 
I like this one too, the Lion Tamer um, from the collection of, so this is Ray Harrell again, and it's in the author's collection, right, her private collection. This is another one that's a bit sexy. Um, Ray Harrell, really good, the Lion Tamer, number eight cut. A different kind of a portrait again, right? Has a bit of that burlesque feel, a little bit exotic. Really beautiful, beautiful composition, beautiful woman, lots of makeup, lion. I mean, it's got danger. It's got a little bit of SEX. It's got color. It's got motion. It's got a story. We just don't know the story, so you have to make it up yourself. That's the fun of it. But there's so, the, the diversity in this book is extraordinary, right? The amount of styles, um, the representation of work from all the different authors who contributed to this, super, super, super varied. And that's what you want in a book. Chapter 7 is just on pets, portraits of pets and animals. So, um, you know, this is really cool that she even put this part in. This is a great rug. It's called Save the Elephants. And it is done by, again, Donna Harkman, um, Dayton, Ohio, 2010. Donna did not want to precisely match the natural color of elephants. She says, I started pulling out more blues and greens in the gray family, and they seem to combine really well without being cartoonish. I am all about shading, so the subtle color gradations were a fun challenge. The lines I use are contoured to show shapes and folds and wrinkles, and even in large flat areas like the mother elephant's ears, there is direction and movement in the lines. Um, so this is a beautiful piece with a beautiful quote from Jane Goodall. The least I can do is speak out for those who cannot speak for them, for those who cannot speak for themselves. So portrait of elephants, right? Um, um, looks like a mother and a, and a child. Really beautiful. This whole chapter just on animals, right? Because also portraits, still falling into the category of portraits. So really, really um, complete book. Chapter eight is my favorite chapter about adding interest. So this is where all the kinds of conversations come in about backgrounds. This piece is called Free Dance by Diane Phillips, uh, Fairport, New York. Um, beautiful, right? Motion, movement, color. It's just explosive. So in this last chapter, she is really talking about the vast amount of things that fall in, into the everything else category, right? All of these other things that you would want to think about and consider before you just start going for it. Um, another great one here, Ginkgo's and Grannies, a good sort of lesson in uh, composition in and of itself, designed and hooked by Sharon Townsend, Altoona, Iowa. Um, this is another beautiful one, right? Not, not a traditional portrait, Ginkgo's and Grannies combines right, nature, right, organic shapes like the ginkgo leaves, people, portraiture, and also patterning. So this is like a triple, triple whammy coming at you, and it's so effective. So in this last chapter, she gives you a whole bunch of things um, that you might want to think about, you know, more things for your bag of tricks. You don't have to be mindful and put each tip in the front of your mind as you work. You will naturally... Um, lock into certain things that are said and run with them like a football and that's what you're supposed to do if you sit around and try to you know agonize and and let all of it sink in you will just become paralyzed and overwhelmed you need to pick out the things that really speak to you in books like this and with those things just a few things in the front of your mind then you start your work right and if it's not exactly the way you want or you see something that could have been better, then, then you use that information when you move on to the next project. Um, but it's a lot of information in these books. It's almost encyclopedic in its scope. So you just pick out the things that you think ap appeal and apply the most to the way that you work, right? And next time you look at the book, whether it's later this year, next year, in five years, you'll pick out different things then because you'll be a different person then. And that's exciting too, right? That's exciting. So she talks at the end about critiquing your own design. And she talks about what she thinks about when she looks at a piece of her own work. And she's fairly hard on herself, but you know, she, she both compliments the things that she thinks she does well, and she, she notes the things that she thinks she can do better. And I think that's a really smart thing. That's a nice, it's a, it's a long piece. That's a nice piece to read because it's not bad practice to look at your own work and think, ah, 
we got a bit of a seesaw here. There's some good stuff going on, and there's some stuff that maybe wasn't an epic win here, maybe stuff I can improve upon in the future, but a moment in time and one of my many great pieces, right? So it just falls into the catalog of my great work, and I'll do something different next time. Um, she critiques herself in a, in a, a practical and helpful way. Um, and I think it's good to look at the sort of criteria she uses to, to look at her own work uh, when you're looking at your work, right? Instead of pulling stuff out and just giving up on stuff, um, just thinking of your work as utter garbage, you just can't do that, right? You have to see the good parts of it too. And you have to use those good things, repeat them in the future and the things that didn't work so well, you have to let those fall by the wayside if they're bothering you because we are always our own worst critic. I'm going to show you two more pieces, and then I'm going to get going. Um, these two pieces are very different at the end of the book. <coughs> this one is by Peg Irish, and she um, she was the person who did the one I used for the thumbnail a couple days ago, the two women sitting next to each other with the three-dimensional little embroidery frames on their laps. This one is very different. It's called, incredibly great title, Square Peg by Peg Irish. It's a very pixelated piece. Really, really beautiful. It's like that artist with the photographs, right, who cuts them out. And it, the, the pieces are so gigantic that you can really tell shading and everything. Um, so cool. So cool. And, you know, you can do this with your, even I can do this with my technology, um, computer or phone or whatever. You know, there's all kinds of filters for pixelating things. You can pixelate your face right out blow it up to the point where you're looking at it that way and then you transfer it that way and then you hook it that way. It would work for you too. It's a great idea. And this piece, no, this piece, I just love this piece. It's got a very magic carpet feel to it. Let me read the text. If I can't break my ropes now, do I really expect to do it later? And there is actually a chain uh, sort of applique on here. I think that is absolutely beautiful. Greek key design going around the border. Look at the motion in that. Look at the motion and emotion in that. Gorgeous piece. That is by, designed and hooked by Linda Ray Coughlin, Warren, New Jersey, 1999. My Ropes. Um, cut, new, and recycle hand-dyed wool and other fabric strips plus rope embellishment on linen. So I'm going to leave it there, but this book really takes you uh, through the spectrum of different kinds of portraiture, um, whether it be animals, whether it be groups, whether it be pairs of pants, however you see yourself telling a story um, of a person or a pet, there's so many ways to do it. I think we've touched on many of them. There's a lot more in this book, but I think we've touched on many of them and at least had some food for thought, right? That's the thing. The food for thought, that's the thing. Um, but in any case, this is the book that we looked at this week on Monday morning on Coffee Time at 10 a.m. Cheers, my dears. Um, I'll, I'll announce the three winners who will get this book for free and Rug Cooking Magazine will send it to you. And uh, on that episode of uh, Coffee Time on Monday morning, as soon as I do that, I will announce our next book giveaway. So we have two more books this month, sponsored by Row Cooking Magazine, um, that we'll be giving away three copies of each. So I will announce on Monday, after we do the giveaway uh, names for Hooked Drug Portraits by Anne-Marie Littenberg, I will uh, introduce the next book that we'll be looking at, uh, published by Raw Cooking Magazine, that will be our next giveaway book. And hopefully it's another one that you really love, that we can really dig into. These are all great books, four great books that we chose together this month, um, because I think that they're books that we can really dig into together, and we have so far. Oh, are you inspired, Kirsten? That's great. Yeah, Mom, please give us thumbs up, subscribe, like, anything you can do to make these videos uh, visible so other people can find them easily and also learn and enjoy. Oh, it is a wonderful book. Hey, the least we can do is talk about it. It's so beautiful and it's so well done. There is such a colossal amount of important work in this book that it's just, it's just crazy. Doreen, have a great weekend. It was an inspiring night. Poetry, pictures, stories, right? And conversation in the sidebar. What more do you want on a Friday night, huh? <laughs> 
Okay, thumbs up, everybody. Uh, don't forget to enter. The link is in our Facebook group, Broke Hooking and Punch Needle Club. It's in the body of this video. Or if you just go to Ribbon Candy Hooking and search for giveaway, portraits book, I'm sure it'll come up. Have a great weekend, everybody. I hope that I will see you tomorrow. I know there's at least a couple of people from our immediate group going um, to Madison where I'll be teaching. And otherwise, think about um, taking that Magdalena class with me on Sunday night. It's a design class. I will not put you on the spot. I will never put you on the spot. Um, but it's going to be a great class for talking about design, looking at rugs, looking at images, and working out some of our own compositions. It's a super, super fun series. And this is a reprise class we're doing. The main class for the month is mid-century modern design. So we'll be doing that a little bit later. But on Sunday night is our Magdalena class. So that will be it for Magdalena for a while. I hope to see you there because I've got a lot of good info for you and it's going to be fun. It's also recorded. So if you can't make it then, you still get all the same materials and you can watch later and do all the same exercises with us, uh, just not in live time. Oh, thanks, Aileen and Dave. Happy weekend. Cheers, my dears. Have a great weekend. And I will see you on Monday, if not before.